So on Tuesday, Lori and I had an extended time of devotions together as we thought and prayed together about the season of Lent starting the next day. And my question for her was, what are you hoping um, will happen in your own life uh, during this season of Lent? And her immediate response to me had to do with fruitfulness in regards to the ministries that she oversees with children and with youth. In other words, her goal was other focused for fruitfulness, which is good, it's what you want in your church staff. Um, however, I challenged her to make a Lenten goal for herself that was really about her own relationship with Jesus Christ, that I, that some, reminding myself and her that we can become so other focused that we are forgetting the importance of being connected to Jesus ourselves and receiving what we need from him so that we can pour out then into the lives of others. When we were at the Eco Conference, we heard this personal challenge, which I thought was just so um, important for those who are leading. The best thing we can bring to our leadership is our own transforming self. The best thing we can bring um, to our leadership is our own self that is constantly growing and changing in our relationship with the Lord. The best thing that you can bring to others is uh, conversations about what God is doing in your life and how you see God at work around you. Which means, of course, that we have to be allowing God to be doing something in and through us. So um, as we were talking about that, I was led to open the Bible to the Gospel of John chapter 15, those verses that we all know very well. I read a portion of them as we began this morning. So let's take a listen. This is John 15, one through eight. Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So in the context of our devotions that morning, what we really heard, what jumped out at us was the word remain remain. We must remain personally, individually. We must remain connected to the vine. We must remain with Jesus. We must abide in him. And that's a great goal for all of us for Lent, that we would remain with Jesus and allow his character um, within us to grow ever stronger and our relationship with him to grow ever deeper with him. And then the natural result will be flourishing fruit bearing. That's just the natural result then of that. But one of the other things that caught our attention as we were reading that morning was um, the words that said that God will cut off any branches that bear no fruit and he will prune any branches that have the potential to be bearing more fruit. He'll cut off any branch in us that bears no fruit and he will prune any branches that have the potential to be bearing more fruit. So Lori and I then went to prayer and um, we prayed a submitting prayer um, to the Lord for ourselves that sounded something like this, Lord, as we help us to remain in you, help us to abide in you, Lord. And we say to you, Lord, go ahead, cut, go ahead prune. Cut off anything in our lives that is not bearing any fruit for you, Lord. Just cut it off and prune anything in our lives that needs to be pruned in order to bear more fruit for you. And then I prayed a similar prayer for our congregation. 
Lord, help us to abide as a congregation in you. Help us to remain in you. Cut off or prune any programs, ministries, or practices, Lord, that are not bearing eternal fruit for your kingdom. And as I was praying that, I felt within my soul a rooted confidence that that prayer was straight from God's mouth to my ears. So we've been reading the, the Old Testament, and would all of you agree, those of you who are reading, that we have seen that God is very, very active, right? In all of these books, God is very, very active. There are many, many times when God is sending signs of his presence and his power to his people. I mean, for example, the burning bush and the parted sea and taking out stronger armies on behalf of the weaker army of the Israelites, that fiery pillar at night and the cloud guiding them by day, bringing forth water from a rock and raining down food that they could have food to eat every single morning, earthquakes swallowing up whole families as an act of discipline. I mean, would you agree with me that God has been very noticeable, that God has been very present, that God has been very active in what we have been reading so far in our Bibles? Do I hear an amen? amen. Okay, all right, we have seen that. So here's a question for you. Is God still doing these sort of things today? Is God still active and present in the world and in our lives today in, in similar ways? I mean, is he giving us direction? And is, is he giving confirmation of certain directions today by sending us signs? I believe, I stand firm that he is. And I believe that before Tuesday, before Lori and I had our devotions, and I believe it even more after Tuesday. And let me tell you why. About an hour after Lori and I were praying, and we prayed this prayer, asking God to cut off and prune anything in our ministries here that needed to be cut off and pruned, we heard a thump in the building, and there was nobody else here with us. We weren't sure where it was coming from. We were sitting in the library. It's where we do our work together throughout the week, and um, it sounded like a bird had hit the window out here, which has happened before, so we sort of ran in that direction. Um, I was still looking out the windows, looking to see if there was an injured bird out there, and I heard Lori say, I think it was this. And in, on the floor in my office was this picture, this print, um, and it had fallen forward, and it was just lying on the floor in front of my desk. Now, this is obviously a picture of an old country church. I bought it uh, many years ago, actually before, right before I moved in here in 2002. I liked the picture, I liked the feelings that it evoked of a place of peace and beauty. This print essentially has been uh, leaning against the indent in my desk for 17 and a half years, friends. I I'm sure we touched it and we moved it because we did put new tile in there and we had to change the carpet, but essentially for 17 and a half years, this picture has been right there. There's a little indent there that maybe you can't see, but that's where it has been. And on Tuesday, an hour after we prayed a very particular prayer for our church, it falls forward on the carpet. Now, my first words to Lori were, wow, that has been there a really long time. Why would it fall over now? And we glanced around the office to see if there were some clues as to why something like that might happen. We didn't see anything. But my, essentially, my next thought was about why this might have happened, why God might have made that happen right now. We just prayed that God would cut off or prune anything in the ministries, the programs, and the practices here in our church that weren't bearing any fruit. And so I said to Lori, could it be that, that one of the things that God is telling us that we need to cut off is anything that could be in our minds that are, is, is putting forth a picture of the perfect country church, that we're holding a thought in our minds of what the perfect church is supposed to be. Could God be sending us a, a message about a stronghold that might be present within our congregation of which we were not aware 
So here's a question. Here are some questions. What, what is the perfect church to you? A congregation where everybody knows everybody else and we know everybody's name? A congregation where we sing songs that everybody knows already? A congregation where the building is always clean and neat and put together, not, not messy in any way? Um, a, a congregation where pretty much everybody around us looks the way we look? A congregation where there are babies, but they aren't too noisy? Where there are people with special needs, but they don't require too much of us? A congregation where the minister always wears her black church pants on Sunday morning and where the communion bread is always delicious. And the spot that we like to sit in is always available to us. What is included in your picture of the perfect church? I mean, people go church shopping, right? What is it they're looking for? What kind of perfection is it that we're looking for? And is the picture that we have in our minds, the expectations we have, is it biblical? Is it biblical? Is it a fruit-bearing picture? Is it a picture of a church that is truly bearing fruit for the Lord? Is it a church that is bringing people to Jesus, as it says in, says in Acts chapter 2, that daily people were being saved, people were added to the number, those who were being saved? And so I'm wondering if God is calling us individually and as a congregation to remain in him and to abide in him and to accept and, in fact, embrace the picture of a perfectly imperfect church, a perfectly imperfect church where everything is not always wrapped up the way that we want them to be. Because quite frankly, when you are a church that is truly leading people to Jesus and welcoming people here who don't know Jesus and don't know the practices of the church and come in and things can get a little messy, friends. What do we need to do? What do we need to get rid of in our minds and our thoughts in order to embrace this truth that the only thing perfect about any church is the perfect savior, Jesus Christ. The only thing perfect about any church is the perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen? Okay. Well, about an hour later, on that same Tuesday morning, after the picture fell over, we heard another crash. It was a smaller one this time. Lori was ahead of me and she sort of leaped into my office to see if she could catch something that might be going on in there. And on the floor this time was a picture of me and John in the Jordan River in Israel in 1999. I was marking John with the sign of the cross using Jordan River as a way of reminding him of his baptism in that river where Jesus himself was baptized. So. The question is, what now, Lord? <laughs> Why are John and I on the floor face down, <laughs> right? I mean, after I, I get this one, but why, why are we are the ones who are there? I mean, I have, you go in my office, there are so many pictures on my show. Why is this the one that is on the floor? And here's what I think perhaps God wants us to cut off. I think God wants to make sure that we are cutting off an old, unbiblical way of thinking about church leadership as always being clergy-centered and clergy-led, where the pastor basically does everything and knows everyone and attends every event, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And quite frankly, I'll say that this is something we've had our eyes on for a while, that we have been working hard to begin to develop more leadership here in the congregation. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I put together a list just to be able to see it with my own eyes. There are currently 63 different people who are serving on boards and on committees here and as small group facilitators, and that's really great. That's a great number of people, but quite frankly, it's, it's not enough because there's a whole bunch of us are, who are still just sitting as audience members, so to speak and um, not submitting to God's call on our lives to serve. 
Something needs to change. The other part of the message on that in that particular picture being on the floor, and I don't really like to say this out loud because I never want to bring attention to myself. I don't, but if you are one of those people who are walking around with this thought in your head, I hope Megan never retires because I don't know what our church is gonna be like. I don't know how we're gonna make it when she and John are no longer here. If you have that kind of a thought rolling around in your head, you better cut that off right now in Jesus' name. Can, I, can somebody say amen, please? Okay, cut it off and take that thought captive to Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church. This congregation will flourish whether John and I are here or not, as long as you guys, everybody, is doing their part and you're keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ, who alone is the head. Repent of that way of thinking right now. Cut it off. So on then Wednesday, the next day, it's Ash Wednesday, we come into this sanctuary around 4.30 to get ready for the service, go up, turn things on, and the soundboard, and the soundboard, it, we, it, it was bad. We had a noise, we couldn't get rid of the noise, we couldn't use PowerPoint, there was a line running through our PowerPoint. John and Nick, God bless them, tried so hard to get it figured out, but eventually we had to turn everything off and just go strip down on Ash Wednesday. And that is a reminder to me that you know the powers of darkness are all, always looking to take down that which is light and love and goodness. So um, it just it was a reminder that we need to be praying all throughout Lent, that the devil is always nipping at our heels, always a roaring lion trying to take somebody out. So it's not going to stop us. We put our ashes on our forehead as a reminder of our mortality. We shared together the Lord's Supper as we began Lent together. So that's Tuesday and that's Wednesday. On Thursday, I got a call from the Reverend Crystal Lide, who today is back in the pulpit at Port Royal Mexico Presbyterian Churches. Praise the Lord. Karen was just there filling the pulpit the last couple of Sundays. Praise the Lord. This mighty woman of God was given a couple of weeks to live back in December, but God had another story for her than what the doctors knew. So I love this woman so much. She is so spirit-filled. She just is a dear, dear colleague and friend to me. So as we're talking on the phone and just praising God, I said, so I want to tell you something that happened on Tuesday. So I told her what had happened with these pictures, and I wish that I could have recorded her response. But essentially, here's a summary. This is what she said back to me without hesitation. Megan, we have such a tendency to try to see everything in the natural, she said, to try to see everything in the natural and cut off the supernatural, she said. We have such a tendency to try to see everything in a way that we can understand it and then to cut off the supernatural. But God is supernatural. We serve a God who is above the natural. So she said, I hope you are paying attention. I said, I am. I am paying attention. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, this is pretty out there today, Megan. Uh, God doesn't knock over pictures in order to make a point. Really? On, on what basis would we have that thought in our mind, right? There is nothing that God cannot do in order to make a point, in order to take his body here on earth to the next level. There's nothing that God can't do, and I don't think there's not much that God would not do. It got our attention. And when I got home and told John about what had happened on Tuesday night, one of the things I said to him was that partly Lori and I wondered if maybe there was a mouse in my office who was um, causing some havoc in there. And my dear husband, whom God has given to me as a, as a true partner in ministry, said, God can use a mouse to do his work too. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I hope that redeems uh, him from what I was uh, dissing on him last week about his list, right? <laughs> Make him feel a little bit better. Something needs to change. A bunch of you have been in the study now in this past hour um, about the urgent spiritual and physical needs that are 
happening all across the globe, but in a more specific and uh, more geographically um, specific way, something needs to change, obviously. It's okay, oh, it's all right. Something needs to change in our own lives, something needs to change in the life of our congregation. I believe God knocked two pictures over to send us in little old spring run a message about things that need to be cut off and things that need to be pruned here in order for us to be the kind of church that he wants us to be. I don't want to be a barrier. I don't want any of you, I don't want us to put up any barriers that would prohibit God from doing exactly what God wants to do in and among us, cutting and pruning. And so I do pray that in this Lenten season that we would all draw closer to remain in him, the true vine, that we would allow him to cut and prune in whatever way he needs to cut and prune so that we can be more fruitful, flourishing, fruitful for him. And so I am going to pray now for you, and then I'm going to pray for the church. And I invite you, if you would like, to open your hands as a sign of release and as a sign of acceptance as I pray. Lord, in this moment, I submit my life to you. Help me to remain in you, to abide in you. Cut off any branch in me that is not bearing any fruit for you. Go ahead, Lord, cut it off. Prune any branch in me that is ready to bear more fruit. Go ahead, Lord, prune away. I submit my life to you as the true gardener for the sake of Christ and his kingdom. Now for the congregation. Lord, in this moment, we submit this congregation to you. Please, Lord, help us to remain, to abide in you. We say to you, cut off any branch, any ministry, any program, any practice, any pattern of thinking that is bearing no fruit for you here. And we say, prune any ministry, any program, any practice, any pattern of thinking that is right to bear more fruit for you. Go ahead, Lord, cut away, prune away. We release any mental picture that we might have in this moment of a perfect country church. We release our pastor from being the center of the wheel. You, Jesus, alone are the center of the wheel. And all of us, including our pastor, want to move and work at the impulse of your love, alongside one another, looking to you together as the source and the perfecter of our faith. Put within us, Lord, your vision, your passion for your communities, for this country, for the world where people are living in urgent physical and spiritual need. Oh Lord, all this we pray with hope, with reverence, with faith, and with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In the book of Galatians, we read that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. The Apostle Paul writes, then stand firm and don't let yourselves be burdened again by a, by a yoke of slavery. Jesus died to set us free from all the walls that we put up to protect ourselves from something new, something different, something that might need to change in us, something uncomfortable, but ultimately something good. So I invite us, let's come to the table confessing to the Lord, allowing the Holy Spirit to bring to the to mind those things that we need to confess.
Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, for your grace, for your love, and for your forgiveness. Through Christ the Lord, amen. The Apostle Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, he said, in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me, and who gave himself for me. So brothers and sisters, know that your sins have been paid for, and you have been forgiven because of the broken body and the blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Amen.